our hearts would be God, I thank you so much for your people who are here gathered. Lord, your people who go and they serve and they bless and they give and they lay down their lives. And God, I ask that you would replenish us. God, we came to encounter you tonight. We desire you. Holy Spirit, we honor you. Father, we bless you tonight. We welcome you, God. We welcome you. I want to invite you to do something maybe we don't usually do when we begin with a bang. I want us to take a step back. I want to invite you to just grab out scripture right now. And even to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? If there's a prophetic word, if there's a scripture that you feel this is from God, I want to ask you, can you come up and share it with us? Can you do that? We're going to take these moments right now as we just prepare. We say, God, we didn't come for a program. We came for you. Jesus, we don't need one more thing to do.
know what all this week holds for us. But I'm going to open up this thing I just saw as I saw it. I saw a bear paw, gigantic with claws. And I couldn't help going, Lord, are you talking about donuts? You're talking about real bears. And then I saw a bear cup. And I felt like the Lord said, this is a week for us to become more aware and more in tune with what is going on in the spiritual world around us. There are schemes and attacks that will seem huge and that you feel unable to fight against. There are also schemes and attacks of wanting you to feel compassion for something that seems weak. And I feel like the Lord is saying to us as pastors and as a fellowship, be more aware, be more in tune. Do not give compassion for a bear cub when the, sh the mother is waiting around the corner to devour you. Do not fear the giant thing that seems to be able to crush you because you are neither too weak nor are you too strong. It is not your compassion that's going to change things and your fear is not what God is looking for. Be more aware and more in tune and let's leave this place aware that stuff's coming but we are not at the short end of the stick. on me because he has anointed me to proclaim news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Hear the word of the Lord, for there is refreshing in this place. You who are weary and tired, come and drink of the water that gives eternal life. Come and be refreshed. Be filled with the well, from the well that springs up within. For the joy of the Lord is your strength and he will renew you. This is a season of renewal. This is a season of rejoicing. This is a season of being strengthened in the Lord. This is a time to refresh the anointing that God has put upon you. Come and drink of the water, the Lord says. Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We honor you. We honor you, Jesus. We love your love. Would you open our ear? Would you continue to teach us how to discern? Thank you, Lord, that you want to refresh us. Tonight. We just respond and we say thank you. We say thank you, God. We enter your gates with thanksgiving tonight. We enter through Jesus by giving you thanks. Thank you, God. We thank you, God, for all that you have done.
Thank you, Jesus, for your presence in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you. How many of you are coming from out of town? Raise your hand. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome home. <laughs> How many of you are feeling tired from travels? And those who are local, how many of you are feeling tired for all the work that you've been doing in preparation for this? Those are testimony laughs right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> testimony laughter right there. I just want to tell you that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I want to invite you to tell the person next to you, the, Lord of the, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I want to invite you all to stand up. Lord, you are our joy. And we welcome you in this place. Oh, you are our joy. We bless you, Lord. Psalm 100, 1 to 5. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. All the earth, make a joyful noise. Lord, we bless you. We love you. Woo! We praise you. We exalt you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We make a joyful noise for you, Lord. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with, th with thanksgiving. Can you say, thank you, Jesus, one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we thank you for your goodness, for your mercy. We thank you for your goodness. We bless you, Lord. Make a joyful noise for him. Oh, we praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. We praise you. We love you. Yes. the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet, we'll shout out. Surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. We sing, we sing to the God who heals, we sing to the God who saves, we sing to the God who always makes the way. He hung up on the cross, and he rose up from the grave. Our God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't. 
Open our hearts and let 
God is here tonight, amen? Can we agree? It is God's will to heal today. I just feel like um, as, as we were worshiping, I just, oh, sorry. I just said that, all right. I just felt like um, there's somebody here that's got some arthritis in their hand. Is that anybody? Um, could you go ahead? Awesome. Come on forward. Come on forward. Just a couple of things. And um, an ankle, somebody with an ankle injury or, or ankles really, really hurting bad. Come on forward, we wanna pray for you. And the migraines, some of you have been suffering from migraines. All right, come on forward. If that's you, come forward. Awesome. your name is exalted, move with miracles in this place. Be lifted up. Be lifted up. Oh, my mom is Lord and be exalted.
a sense in your heart that you need to come and pray, I want to invite you. If right where you're at, you want to extend your hands towards somebody, can you join with me? God, right now we pray. If you feel led to come forward and pray for somebody, can you do that? If you feel like the Lord is prompting you, can you come close? Extend your hands right where you're at. Father, we pray for breakthrough right now. We pray for your will to be done right here on earth in their lives. And it's, it is in heaven. It's your will for healing, for health, for wholeness. before the Lamb of God and say you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you our hearts and to you our hearts you deserve the glory, Lord, you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve. 
We're here, you talk, we'll listen. Amen. Have a seat. Well, if you like tonight, there's more to come. Isn't this good? Oh, this is rich. I love this. Um, we set out about uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, in fact, our first meeting about Encounter 20, the, the FCA convention, was uh, November the 30th. 2021 and the theme encounter came to mind and it just seemed to resound with us that there would be an encounter with God that when we gathered it wouldn't just be that we fellowship one with another but there would be a genuine encounter with God and that that seemed to permeate what we did and and I just believe that's what God's doing today and um, then, and, and then uh, the scripture that comes to mind when I've been thinking about and, and, and pondering this, and everyone else has done all the work, I've done almost nothing, the, there's been an, a slew of people who have done an amazing job putting things together. Scripture kept coming to mind that uh, of the, uh, from the road to Emmaus, was not our heart burning within us as he explained the scriptures to us? And that's my heart of hearts for today, that for this week, that there would be an encounter with Jesus. And as he explains the scriptures to us, something inside would burn. And maybe it's going to burn up, burn out, burn something, but we're going to burn for Jesus. Uh, who many, who's in favor of that? Someone said on that day, and just said these words, God was in the bush before Moses saw it. Before we ever planned this encounter, God was planting, planning this encounter. Before any of us decided that we were going to meet in this church, God knew we were going to meet in this church. He's been planning this for a long time. So uh, my name is Fred Goldsmith. I'm here to welcome you tonight. And thank you for coming. I think as first order of business, now that we've worshiped God, is we give a hearty thanks to the folks that, that from this church, not a fellowship church, they simply said, sure, go ahead and use God's facility for God's thing. And so I don't know if there's any here, but would you give a good round of applause and thanks that they would hear throughout the whole community. They've gone above and beyond in an amazing way, and they have been a true gift to us. So... Uh, now for the most holy announcements, okay? We'll go through these. Thank you. First off, we've got uh, breakouts instead of workshops tomorrow. I know it's just a name, but it's going to be different. You're going to have to look in your brochure we gave you tonight. Pick three that you want to go to tomorrow, and only three, because that's the only ones you're going to be able to go to. However, most of them are repeated the next day. These will be fast-paced, and you'll need to move from breakout to breakout very swiftly. It's going to be different. I hope you enjoy it. But pay attention to the, the, the materials we have labored hard to put into your hands. Thank you. If you are new to FCA in any way, shape, or form, we have a special breakout session for you on Thursday. You'll see it in your brochure. So it says something along the lines new to FCA. Please come to it. Uh, John Sprecher, Dan Hammer are going to lead that. Uh, more announcements. We have a membership. Oh, my goodness. The, the most holy membership meeting is tomorrow at lunchtime at noon in the gymnasium. Please come to that. We're going to provide food so you'll come and enjoy that and enjoy the business meeting. We really do want you to come to that. Let's see. Attendees. Oh, this is so important. 
attendees have the opportunity to win a gift card for $100 by taking a picture at the photo booth, which is right outside that door. And so what you do is you take yourself a picture, post it on social media, hashtag it um, FCA2023, and you'll be in the mix. How about that? I like it. We like free things as pastors, don't we? All right. Daytime events tomorrow morning. Therefore, all registered guests. We've got lunches provided. You can invite guests to the evening session. Please do. And it's open to anybody. It's going to be great evening sessions. And there's desserts following. Please join us if you're a guest tonight. Please join us for desserts. Let's see what else is on here. Prayer is available for you if you would like special prayer. We have two prayer rooms. And there is prayer appointments available to you tomorrow afternoon. Jeff Martin, where are you? He's back. Where? I don't even see you. Ah, See Jeff Martin, and if you see anybody with a red, with a red lanyard, you can check with us. We'll, we'll hook you up as well. We do want to receive an offering this, this evening. We realize that you paid your registration. If you would like to help us, please do by uh, helping us to make sure that this conference comes, uh, comes in in the black. We suspect it will, and to be a blessing to future conventions. We just know that when people come to places like this, you want to give. The gentlemen, the folks are going to bring off. I knew they would. They're getting it all together. Just in time for us to pray. When they get down here, they'll start going that way. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for making us sufficient. Not only we have more than enough, we have an abundance. We have been given and given and given to. It is our hope and desire to look like you, be like you, act like you, give like you, and we're going to try it out right now. So, God, thank you for blessing us. Help us to be a blessing to the people around us and for the future generations. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You can also give online. There's a QR code floating around. You'll see it in your booklet. You might see it on screens here and there. It's a good opportunity to give online. Our morning session begins at 9 a.m. At each session, the kids' ministry opens up 15 minutes before the before the session begins, and those children should be picked up immediately following each session. Immediately following each session. Okay? Very important. The youth have their activities after this evening. During the morning sessions, they'll have uh, activities after the worship service. There's information in all of your packets on all of that. Now, let's see. One, one last thing. Uh, we want you to enjoy the presence of God and worship in this place. It not, we started early today. That was on purpose. Feel free to come before the session begins. Spend time in the presence of God. In fact, you can join the worship team if you want. Come into this place. Find your Bible. Find a place and enjoy as they practice. And they're going to wrap up their practice about 15 minutes before. And we're just going to worship God together and to get rolling without even a, without even a startup. Is that okay? Is that a good idea? Didn't you love it tonight? Okay, good. You're going to love the message we have this evening and the speaker that's coming to visit with us. Steve Rasmussen is going to introduce him. Good evening, everybody. So great to see you, old friends, new friends. And uh, I'm very, very excited about our speaker tonight. He is the CEO of the Trust Edge Leadership Institute. He has spoken on six continents. I've seen him speak to thousands of people, including one of those continents was... Kenya and the president of Kenya and the opposition, and he's preaching about trust, and uh, thousands of people there, lo lots of places around the world. I got to know him a, a little over 40 years ago when he was just starting his career. Um, and uh, then his early ministry was in ministry, full-time ministry, and then he felt a real calling to move into ministry to the marketplace. He's been doing that for 20 years. A lot of places, Toyota, FedEx, uh, MIT, um, whatever, uh, every place. I've, I've been with them in workshops, uh, multiple days, leadership summits, other things. Um, what has been interesting to me, and, so, um, and I've watched him go through challenges, like when everything dried up in 2008. Well, that's when God helped him write this book, which is dedicated to Jesus, who is worthy of my trust, um, best-selling national bestseller. Um, and these other, this is the latest one, a, a great story that, that communicates it. Um, I have a little inside scoop because he happens to be my wife's brother. And so 
I also get to watch him when nobody else is watching him on stage. I watched him raise four amazing kids. One of them is here, and she's starting on her own ministry. And um, his wife, Lisa, is here. And I want Lisa to come up, and I want David to come up, um, because Lisa has been a full partner with him. She doesn't usually get the stage, but she is uh, the prayer force behind it. She's an elder in her church. She's the one who's pushing her church to, to into more prayer, into listening to the Holy Spirit. And they are a team together, even though she doesn't have to do all the traveling. She has to take care of those four kids sometimes. And anyway, so David, I'm so happy, and Lisa's so happy that you guys can be here. And I'm so happy that you can meet all of my friends, old and new, from many years. And so, David and Lisa, take it away. <laughs> I think you should pray. You're here. You better pray. Uh, better, better. <laughs> Yeah, let's do that. Oh, Father God, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your presence here tonight. God, thank you for what you're doing already with your people as they've gathered to honor you. And God, we want to talk about trust, and you're the author of trust. And so, Father, we just ask that you would open our ears um, to understand more about how we can trust you, how we can trust each other, and what you mean by trust. We're here with you, God. Thanks for the opportunity. Amen. Amen. All right. Never know what's going to happen when Steve gets a mic, right? Or any of you pastors. Fundamentally, we're going to start secular research. We'll get to what God says about it. Number one, I believe a lack of trust is the biggest cost you have in your church. I believe it's the biggest expense we have. This goes back to my graduate work. I believe a lack of trust is the biggest cost we all have. Everything of value is built on trust. People don't give at your church because they don't trust you. They don't come to your church if they don't trust you. There's fundamental pe people. The number one question everybody is asking about you is not, do I like you? I got friends I like a whole lot. I wouldn't go into business with them in a million years. The number one question everybody's asking about you is, can I trust you? Can I trust you to put this kid on that school bus and take him there safely? Can I trust you with this month's money, Mr. Financial Advisor? Can I trust you with this advice? Can I trust you preaching the word of God? Can I, can I trust you? Because it's always a trust issue. You never have a leadership issue. The only reason anybody follows a leader or not is trust. You don't ever have a sales issue in a company. The only reason people buy has something to do with trust. Teams, we learned, innovate when they trust each other. Otherwise, they're too share, scared to share ideas. Marketing is only amplified when we increase trust in the message. Learning only goes up in a classroom when you increase trust in the content, the professor or teacher, or the psychological safety or trust of the room. Diversity, equity, inclusion. The biggest Harvard study shows diversity on its own pits people or puts people against each other in some way unless you increase trust, and then, of course, you can get enormous benefits out of diversity, equity, inclusion, but you have to deal with trust. A lack of trust is the biggest cost you have. Before we get into it, I know what some of you are thinking, oh, we got a global trust expert here tonight. Oh, I bet we're going to have to, like, do trust falls and give back rubs. <laughs> Before we do those, <laughs> here's your trust fall. <laughs> Buddy, your sister wants to try something that's called a trust fall. She just learned how to do it. Okay. You want to try it? Sure. It's super easy. All right. What you need to do is you close your eyes, and then you're going to fall, but she's going to catch you. Okay. All right? You promised to catch your brother, right? Yeah. All right. Good. So close your eyes. Now go catch your brother. All right. On the count of three, I want you to fall, but she'll catch you. One, two... Three. Oh. So we have a trust issue. But what is trust? What, is it, what does it mean to trust? And what, what, what actually is trust? It, learn, it turns out, when we go back to my grad work, even like, I thought, oh, trust, that's just character. That's just integrity. That's just this, that's just that. It turns out trust is a lot more complex than we think. Back when I was doing the research, and this is... Go, go, before we talk about uh, what scripture says about uh, just secular research, um, university research, basically, they, there was, there was very, the first thing you do is um, you do the research of the research. And at that time, there was relatively no research in this space. 
Now in the last five or 10 years, everybody's talking about trust with and mostly without research. There's an expert today that says trust is transparency. And we know from the research, transparency in a leader can build trust, but transparency is not trust. Some of your kids are so transparent on social media, I don't trust them for a second. Because confidentiality is also trusted. It's more complex than we might think. What is it? We have different pictures of what trust actually is in our heads. I mean, gentlemen in the room, here's a picture of trust. <laughs> Who wants to be the first dude? You're up. <laughs> My sons, when they understood trust, Walk in the public restroom, stall wasn't available, they get my work. <laughs> That's Mike on top. Even animals have a perspective, but what is it? So instead of being like pastors do and preach all night, we're going to be a little bit like Jesus who often holds a conversation and asks questions. So you have 60 seconds with the person next to you. What does trust, well, if you had to define trust with one word, how would you do it? 60 seconds, be ready in the back, I'm going to call you out. 60 seconds, how would you define trust with one word? Talk. Okay, team, here we go. Back and forth. You don't get to preach to each other all night. This is, this is back and forth because you'll have more times to talk. Ready? Everybody's listening out of respect to each other. All right, good. We're coming back. Okay, a word for trust. Daryl, what's a word? Dependable. Great word for trust, isn't it? What do you think? Consistency is true, isn't it? Whatever, I will trust you for whatever you do consistently. If you're late consistently, I will absolutely trust you. To be late, right? What do you say? What's the word for trust? Knowing. Knowing. Knowledge. Is that right? Yes. Okay, what do you think? Belief. Belief, Belief is a good word for you. You thought looking away was going to help. Uh, Not so. I tried, man. And I, Jesus, you got it on your name tag. I mean, you're going to be like that. <laughs> Jesus, good word, right? It's written. What do you think? Well, we all, all dependable. What, he said anything different back here? Faith, Reli Pardon? Yeah, yes be yes, sir. Reliability, this section. Safety, you cannot teach in an environment and have people learn if you don't create a safe environment. Safety is a synonym of trust in many cases. Anything different over here? Vulnerability, integrity. What about back here in the back? My New York friends sitting way back there, you met me to eat with, and you said, I'm sitting at the very back after meeting that dude, right? What do you got? Honesty, anything different here? Confidence is trusted, isn't it? What do you think over this section? We're finally getting to the smart section. What do you got? How old are you? 15, you, you, pretty soon you'll know everything once you get to college, right? Isn't that right? <laughs> oh, you already do. Okay, good. Uh, all right. Anything different over here? Hello. Nice to see you. Look at that. The siblings are here. Sit far apart, though. The, the, um, all right. So there's a lot more we could say about this, but let's come to a definition. I'm just going to give you what I did in my grad work, put some of these words together. You could have put a lot of what you said together. It would probably even be a better definition. This is what we still use out of the Institute today. Trust is a confident belief in a person, a product, or an organization. And when I can confidently believe in you, everything changes. When I can confidently believe in you as pastor, you don't have to be perfect, but when I can confidently believe in you, everything changes. I'll give you the first half of my grad work, hundreds of organizations, thousands of leaders in one slide. Here it is. When trust went up, output, morale, retention, productivity, innovation, loyalty, it all went up, cost problems, skepticism, it all went down. Trust was always the leading indicator. Always. Was the leadership a leading indicator? Was money a leading indicator? Was never. Trust was the leading indicator. If you think trust doesn't affect the bottom line, we grew up in one of the poorest counties in Minnesota. Um, I didn't grow up in, in near, there's my sister. Hey, Jan. All right. 
what happened? He decided not to sit by you after he prayed. He said, forget it. Okay. She's awesome. You got, yeah, man, I had, I, what? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Um, so we grew up in, in one of the poorest, sometimes the poorest county or second poorest county in Minnesota. What does that mean in Minnesota, by the way? No lakes. No lakes. In that county, there's one of the fewest, two, two counties with the fewest lakes. Or, and, it's not in the Red River Valley where there's good soil. It's kind of sand and rocks where you try to farm anyway. In my years, we were known for dry edible kidney beans, especially we had potatoes sometimes, other things. But uh, it, kind of a bean farm is how I remember it because we were really into beans in my years there. And what I remember was we didn't grow up in town, 500 people, Burndale, Minnesota. We grew up eight miles from Burndale. If that, in those days, you couldn't see another farm from ours, quarter mile dirt driveway. But I remember halfway home, Mr. Olson's veggie stand at the end of his long dirt driveway. Just a table with beautiful produce. And next to the produce, a box with cash bills sticking out of it. And nobody worked the stand. Who's seen this kind of thing before? And we call this system the honor system or trust system. And where you can create it, you've created incredible efficiency. He doesn't have to pay anybody to be there. He saves money. People save time. They can take and go as they wish. If you think trust doesn't affect the bottom line, and by the way, I'm going to start with my business, ex business expertise here because you could think about money. Jesus actually said a whole lot about money. The first minute, the first, well, I'm not, not going to get into that board. Okay. I'm not going to give that board. <laughs> All right. Bottom line, for many of us, money, if you have it and use it well, you affect the mission more. If you're a missional organization like ours, we have more money, we actually affect the mission more. Think about this. Let's get simple. I'm not going to give a ton of research tonight, but I'm going to give a little bit uh, but before we kind of break open the word about it. And that is, um, what's a good example of a lack of trust? A lock is a good example, isn't it? There's only one reason I put a lock on anything. There's only one reason I'd ever buy a lock. There's only one reason to have a lock, and that is because I don't trust you. And what's the cost of putting a lock on any gate? There are two big costs. What are they? One cost is, I gotta buy a lock. But the biggest cost is time. Now I gotta open it. What if it's a combination lock? Ah, forevermore. Massive cost. Text someone you trust how long that takes. Boop, done. Now, write a text to someone you don't trust. How long does that take? Oh, delete. They will take that wrong. Oh, delete. <laughs> Forevermore. Some of you parents got a teenager who you trust Friday nights. <sighs> you got a teenager you don't trust Friday nights. Biggest stress you have. You got someone you work with at your church you trust. <sighs> you got someone you don't trust. Biggest stress you have. A lack of trust is the biggest cost you have and the biggest cost I have. Now, before I get into this, let me just tell you something. I believe in this work. I believe in what God says about this work, who was talking about trust, turns out way before I ever was in my research. But I believe in the research. We've seen companies gain 11% market share in one year, big company. We saw someone lose, uh, gain, uh, uh, have attrition fall by two to four million dollars in nine months. We've had people say they use this work we're going to talk about to triple sales in 90 days, and we've had people say it saved their marriage. I believe in this work. But before I get into it, I'll tell you right now, I'm totally imperfect at all of it. I believe it's true, but I'm totally, I don't have any teenagers here tonight. You're 20 now. Oh my goodness. But if I had the teenagers here, they would tell you, yep, he's not perfect at this work. But it's true, in spite of me. So when we talk about how you build trust the fastest, and we'll give a framework for that, I'm not perfect at it, but there's a tendency I've noticed, and that is people listening often think about everybody else that needs this. <laughs> Just did an event not too long ago in Las Vegas, 2,000 people, one of the biggest events of its kind. I'm the opening keynote. Afterwards, we had books back. We have books actually, to, actually at the table back here. Um, if you like books, they're there. And Amy, my dear assistant, will throw out a few hundred dollars worth. You can just make your own change and pay what you owe. It's like that little stand. 
If you want a credit card thing, you can use that. If you really don't have enough money and you'd really like to read a book and not just make it a doorstop, just take one. No one will say a word. But that's out there somewhere, right? Perfect. Um, I was at this event. I'm signing books at the back. And uh, people like I'm signing, I don't know. It doesn't go up in value. But, um, and if, by the way, if you go, you can get it signed. Anybody will sign it. I'll be there too. But <laughs> yeah, anybody sign. Anyway, so <laughs> you, this, the, I'm back there signing. And you cannot believe how many came up to me and said, David, I believe in that. I love what you said about that trust stuff. That's such good trust. I love that trust stuff. Can you sign this one to my spouse? They really need this stuff. Can you sign this to my team? Can you sign this to my boss? They need this. I'm going to give this to my boss. Hey, they're not here tonight. And every time I talk about this, I'm convicted and compelled to do something differently. I need it. We all need it. Let's go. So a glimpse of the research uh, from the Eloquip. If you'd like access, and I think we have some of the research here tonight, but if you'd like the, I think it's one of the biggest studies on trust and leadership, uh, certainly out of North America. It's a global study, but if you'd like the white papers, we're happy to give them to you. But I'll just give you a little bit of our newest research. Number one reason, in first world countries, if, if, uh, certain countries, if, if they didn't have enough to put food on the table, uh, compensation came in. But in first world countries, number one reason people want to work for an organization, number one, ahead of compensation and a more fun work environment with a ping pong table, they want to trust their leadership more than anything else. And that's the same where you are. If you're leading that church, that's what they want. Nine out of 10 Americans wouldn't refer products or services they don't trust. It's not, if you're in a business, it's not an NPS issue or a net promoter score issue. It's a, it's a trust issue. This is for this very same reason that we created the Enterprise Trust Index for companies because what we learned is you don't get engagement with engagement. You don't measure engagement. You don't get more engagement with more engagement because you don't get it unless you increase trust. Then you get more engagement. Half of boomers, oh, this is fun generations, right? They're so different. Oh my goodness, they're so different. Boomers, they do a lot of things that they trust with their leadership, but by the way, plus or minus 1%, everybody all the way to the new A's said exactly the same thing. Half Americans invested 1000 or more based purely on trust. I was blown away by this. 13 million Americans said they invested $100,000 or more based purely on trust. I could give you more examples around it, but let's keep going. By the way, the number one reason to influence a change of opinion, it turns out it's not social media. It's still trusted relationships. But people don't trust, and we've got a big problem, so let's, let's keep going for tonight. The bottom line is the research shows a lack of trust is the biggest cost you have and the biggest cost I have. It's the biggest cost you have in your church, biggest cost of your family. It's the biggest cost I have. I'm, and, and I run the institute, and I have gaps of trust myself. It's the biggest gap I have. So before we get, come to look at the biblical themes of trust with the person you're next to, maybe you work with that person at your church, or maybe it's your family, but if you and I don't look at the truth, it doesn't do us much good, does it? And it's fun to come together and sing kumbaya and be all happy, but if we don't look at the challenge, we're going to have a hard time solving it. So with the person you're next to, you've got 60 seconds. What do you think a lack of trust is costing you in your family or in your church or in the business you work at? 60 seconds, go. Okay, team, here we go. Everybody listening? All the way over in the far corner. Good job. All right, let's start somewhere else. I got to be careful what I trust. Uh, is that how you do it? You turn your tag around so I can't see your name? <laughs> Ryan, what's a lack of trust costing if you're willing to share? It's costing growth. Absolutely. What's it costing you, Hollis? 
family unity, which is costing what? Stress, years on your life, agony, mind share to be creative because you can't think about this other great thing because you're worried about that thing. It's costing. What do you think? What do you think back here? It's costing time. What do you think, Scott? Same answer? Oh, that's so cute. Thanks for coming tonight. You're going to remember this trust talk forever. How old are you? Four months? And the baby? No, you're not, just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. What, what, what do you think? What's the lack of trust costing? You'd say time? What do you guys say? Morale. Morale. Good answer. That's your kid, and you're proud of that kid. I'm proud of my daughter. You need to think about this. Every time you, if you're a pastor and you're doing strategic planning, you've got to ask this question every time because the biggest cost you have in your church is this question. You do strategic planning, you've got to start with this. What's the lack of trust costing us here? Because that's where your cost is, is in, in, in members, in giving, in impact, in discipleship. So there's two big biblical themes that, you know, after I'm looking at this, and of course I was, you know, in ministry 20, 30, whatever it was years ago, but then I start doing this secular research, and um, I just kept seeing God talk about it. And, and while there were two themes that came out of my grad work, there were two themes that came out of Scripture over and over and over, and there was a major overlap with one of those. So the two themes that come out of Scripture are um, trust in the Lord, right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean on your standing, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll make your path straight. Romans uh, 10, 11, anyone who trusts in him will not be put to shame. Daniel is in the lion's den. You remember this? Daniel uh, 3, 3, 23, there was no wound found on him because he trusted his God. Moses and Aaron, uh, Numbers 20, 12, Moses and Aaron don't get to go in the promised land. You remember all this? Moses. Why? Didn't trust me enough, God said. The first theme is trusting in the Lord. And it's over and over and over. And, it's, and you remember this through the Psalms and Proverbs, what not to trust, what to trust. Psalm 44, Psalm 20, I don't trust in chariots. I don't trust in my bow. I don't trust in a sword. I don't trust in princes. I don't trust, I don't trust, I don't trust. Uh, and uh, uh, 27, uh, I trust in the name of the Lord my God. What I don't trust in, what I do trust in. Proverbs you trust in yourself, you're a fool. And just a bit later, you trust in riches, you fall. What not to trust in which... Even Jesus, by the way, if you think this is simple, this doesn't mean trust everyone. Jesus, John 2, 24, uh, those people remember in Jerusalem, I don't trust them, I know their hearts. Even he starts with little by little, that right before... Uh, the well, and done, uh, well done, good and faithful servant, if you remember the, the, the tenants, uh, uh, the talents, excuse me, uh, he says, well, you, you trust with little, I'm going to trust you with much. I mean, let me just see, let me, okay, I'll give you this. This is, this is a massive problem, isn't it, in pastoring? This is a massive problem. If you listen to, if you want to just, if you want to just gouge your eyes out and feel bad for a week, listen to the podcast, what's it called? Mars Hill, The Fall of Mars Hill by Christianity Today. You just want to die for a while? Listen to that. Big problem. I mean, if you take the main character, true church, you remember this, who grew it to 15,000 or 20,000 people, he, at age 27, had never been a member of a church to any type of Bible school, to any type of training, never been a member, and he was asked to teach at pastor's conferences. So he didn't go little by little. This is what, if, if you, uh, Tim Keller said uh, so humbly and imperfectly, he said that the thing for me was I'm, I'm glad I didn't have social media and some of these ways of growing so fast because for me, I grew, I had to, I, he humbly said, I had to grow in character with my church. Back with, with Tim Keller, it took 30 years to grow a church to a certain amount, Right? 
You didn't just get given 15,000 people in two years or three years. I'm not saying he was given it. And I think God did bless in a way. I think it, things can happen quickly. I think what my daughter's doing is amazing with these Jesus groups very quickly. However, you have to be careful and grow, be trusted little by little. What's the other, uh, oh, Lord, what's that verse? Um, be, uh, it's basically, uh, maybe you guys remember it. Maybe Steve can help me out here. But the, the be, be careful to, uh, don't hastily put oil on. Don't, 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 don't has, hey, thank you, Pastor Jim. The, don't, don't be hasty, don't be quick to lay on hands. It's this thing of trust, don't just, right? It, it, don't be quick about it. It's not easy. This is why in our corporate world, we would say trust is, you don't just say just trust me. That's the first thing. I won't trust you if you do that. <laughs> trust is not stated. Trust is earned, right? And actually, it's, it's it, well, well, you can be redeemed. You even earn trust with, 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 with being given certain things by God. Responsibility. So the first part is trusting him. We could go into this uh, a lot longer. But the other theme is this. And it's the Proverbs 12, 22. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in the trustworthy. This is what he wants for you. Do you remember Jethro talking to Moses? He said, uh, he's like, what you're doing is bad. This is what he said. Remember this? I mean, I don't know if that was the original Hebrew there, but it's like, that's bad job, dude. Not good. You can't do all this. He does say you can still be the, lazy, the main liaison to God. In fact, you should be. You've got, you've got to carry that weight. But find, uh, let me think here, uh, Exodus 18, uh, 21. The, uh, the, find for yourself capable, those that, capable men, those that are trustworthy. Remember this? Find those that are trustworthy. This is the call of you and I tonight. You're pastoring a church. How many churches do we see like Mars Hill and you've seen them in your own denomination that didn't, weren't trustworthy and they fell and they hurt the church and they hurt the church? It's a high call. But he's called you to it, so there you go. I don't have the easy, you could have someone else who has the gift of mercy loving on you. You got that maybe tomorrow night, not tonight. So let's just give, I'm going to give an overview. These two themes, this trustworthy one kept overlapping with God, what God was already saying. Even though once we started to, um, you know, see it in corporate, in, in grad work, all of a sudden the FedEx and Walmart and the New York Yankees wanted our stuff. I didn't, I didn't like the Yankees, by the way, until they started paying me. But um, they, they, I, they uh, you, you, there was a bunch of overlap here. So let me just tell you what, from the research, there were eight ways trust is built, eight traits of the most trusted leaders and organizations of all time. And I believe uh, while they need to be contextualized for when we do uh, build trust in policing compared to the marketplace, compared to corruption issues somewhere, compared to uh, where I might start with uh, Latin America, compared to East Africa, compared to the U.S. Or, or in context, these are the eight. And I hate it when consultants come in and say it's always this way except for on this one thing. I believe it's always trust, and I believe these eight are what build trust globally, and I believe our research proves it. These eight. In a moment, I'll come back and just kind of, you'll be able to see what God said about these way ahead of me, but let me give the eight for context. And the problem is I can talk about each of these eight for at least a couple days each. I'll spend two days with a company on the first one. And you'll go after I say a few sentences, oh, I got it. I did. There's a lot more to it. They do start with C's only to give clarity and because those were in general the best words. Please don't think of them as some sermon like I had to put eight C's together. They are very important research funnels. Here we go. Number one is clarity. We trust the clear and we mistrust or distrust the ambiguous or the overly complex. Clarity wins today. When I was a professor for a short time, boy, we've got to be smart, right? We've got to look smart. Whenever we look, whenever we overcomplexify, we lose trust. Don't look smart. Be clear. 
Clarity, clarity, clarity. The prop with this one, if I worked on this for a while with you, I w we would find I'm talking about clarity at a whole level beyond what most people think. I'm ta people think uh, a paragraph mission Satan, I'm talking about five words. People think we should have values, prayers, I'm talking about this, just this. Clarity wins. And it's so much work. It's so much easier to have a 20-page strategic plan than a half-page, isn't it? It's filled with all kinds of garbage. You mean you're going to put that on a half a page that I can understand, repeat, hold people accountable to? That's too much work. This is for the very same reason that any of you that give long sermons and were unwilling to do the work of making it clear did not serve your audience well. A long sermon isn't better. A clear, compelling sermon is better. Number two, compassion. We trust those that care beyond themselves. You can see this all over scripture, right? Clothe yourselves with compassion and whatever. <laughs> you can see I'm big on compassion. Let's move to the next one. I'm going to go back through them in scripture, but number three is character. People trust those that do what's right over what's easy. There's a whole lot of research around this without anything God said. Yeah, I like the Kelly research that showed the more you seek pleasure for pleasure's sake, the less pleasure you actually get. Isn't that interesting? Guy like ice cream. I like it a lot. Ten scoops right here. I think I'll eat it. <laughs> Afterwards, do I feel better or worse? Worse. He would argue seek satisfaction, not pleasure. Whenever you seek pleasure for pleasure's sake in any area of life, fi any area of life phys uh, uh, physically, financially, sexually, you will always hurt someone and yourself. Sin has a consequence. It turns out. Character. Number three is competency. We trust those that stay fresh and relevant and capable. Massive problem in the church. If you're preaching the same sermon you were 10 years ago, I don't trust you. You can use the same word. I still talk about trust 20 years later. But if you're not learning, if you're not fresh, if you're not relevant, you're not, cap you're not staying fresh, it's a problem. And we can all tell. I know someone I can think of right now that's written a lot of books and they all sound exactly the same. Just use the one unless you got a new one. Stay fresh. Read. This is, there's a, there's a lot of problems here, but let's keep going. I'm going to do exactly what I preached again about going too long. Although he said, you guys don't care. You can go all night. He said, forget it. They're going to stay for the dessert. <laughs> My guy said, we just had dessert. I saw dessert. I would already say, yeah, but we have it twice. Like, okay. All right. So, number five is commitment. We trust those that, do what's, uh, that, 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 that stick with it, right? This is, um, if you think of anybody in your life or history, your mom, your dad, your first grade teacher, Martin Luther King, Mandela, Gandhi, Jesus, or Joan of Arc, you'll find somebody who was trusted by their people because they were committed to something beyond themselves, maybe to death. Oh, you got a pandemic, you're going to jump? I don't trust you. I need someone who's going to go travel with me through it. You got some tough stuff ahead, I'm telling you. You got more than chat GPT and AI. You got blockchain that's going to turn our world upside down. I would argue our friends in Kenya are more ready for blockchain in their banks than our institutionalized banks are today in America. It's going to turn us upside down. I just did a banking conference not very long ago. I asked how many understood blockchain. And presidents of financial institutions in America don't understand it. We got a problem. I've been talking about it for 10 years it's been coming. And in Kenya, they're way more ready. Competent, uh, commitment. We trust those that stay committed. Number six, connection. The willingness and ability to connect and collaborate with others. We trust those that are willing to connect and collaborate. Yeah, but they're Baptists. <laughs> what was Jesus' final prayer? I pray that they would be one like we're one, Father. Number seven. Contribution, this is results. You're actually, you, you want to talk about Mary and Martha forevermore. And I'm telling you, it's good to be, it, that was a word. But those of us that don't ever want to do, love to talk about Mary and Martha, when in fact we are judged. Matthew 7, we're judged by our fruit. You're, you're going you're gonna to be judged by your fruit. 
You think there's no judgment because of one story about Mary and Martha and listen to that story and be and look at, and be with Jesus, no doubt about it, but we're, we're called to do actually. This is, uh, this is the Psalm uh, uh, 37, trust in the Lord and do good. This is the, this is the we're, we're called to actually do some, produce something. Can you open Luke 8 in that? Thanks. Number eight is consistency. Sameness is trusted. You're late all the time. I trust you to be late. The only way to build a reputation is consistency. Good or bad. The only way to build a brand in a company is consistency. Sameness. The same interaction every time. Your brand is a church. Wow, they loved me a lot last time. Oh, they were crap this time. That's a problem. Consistency is trusted. When I do that little, oh, I look like this, and then I look like that. These eight. So if we just think about it, and I just want to process quickly, and you can all think of verses and scripture, but you, you, you think of this, um, I'm sure you've already thought about it in your head, clarity. Uh, you know, Proverbs 29, 18, um, the, 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 uh, without vision, people perish in one translation. This is the, 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 the Psalm 119, um, your word is a light to my path, a, a, a lamp to my feet. Your, your, um, this, this whole, you look at Nehemiah and clarity, clarity, clarity. Number one is clarity. Number two is compassion. It's that uh, uh, Colossians 3.12, clothe yourselves with compassion. You see this over and over and over. First Peter 4.8, um, uh, love covers a multitude of sins. And you see love all over, and that's where that comes under the, the pillars. Character, the, the trust God and do, do good. That's the, that's the um, 1 Corinthians 11.1. Follow my, Paul, so boldly, follow my example. You want to look like Jesus? Just follow me. Follow my example as I follow example of Christ. This is the, the um, Proverbs. He who walks with integrity walks securely, right? The, this is the, the competency one. The biggest thing about the competency one, and you could, you could look at, you know, we're, um, you're going out among the wolves, or sheep, your sheep among wolves, um, but be it as pure as, as, uh, be as wise as serpents, as pure as doves, depending on your translation, right? Um, this is, the, the, the thing I would land on for this one would be this. And I know it's at least five times in scriptures, and you all know the one in James. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the, you know what humble people aren't? Very competent. They're not fresh, they think they know it all already. God gives grace to the humble. God, right now, I believe, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. I believe he's opposing our country. We are so proud. Those Americans, we think we know it all. I, I, had, I remember how, I don't know how old you were, but I was so excited to have my kids sit next to me. I remember sitting from, with my dad and learning when we watched the, the Reagan-Mondale um, debates. I took my kids, gathered around, we sat down and we watched the first Trump and um, Hillary Clinton debates for three minutes. And I said, if I see one more bit of this arrogance from both sides, I'm going to die. I don't want my kids to be anything like that. God opposes the proud. We are proud. I'll tell you what, I can speak from experience. It is easy to get proud on a stage. People ask me all the time, I'm made to solve, to, to be used by God to solve some of the biggest problems in, in, in a company and maybe the world. I'm made for it. But boy, you start getting asked by the president of a country or a company, and you can start thinking you did it. And pastors, I think there's someone in here that might resonate and have the same problem I've had. We think we know it. Well, people are asking you. God opposes the proud. The ones that stay competent, um, they're humble. Commitment. Um, well, this is the, you know, First Peter 5, 8, stand firm in the faith. This is let your yes be yes, your no be no. Um, we could go on and on. We got to keep going. Connection is, um, we see this all throughout Scripture. Jesus started this, right? John, um, um, uh, see John 10, 1, 
when he it, it sent the 72 out. How do you send the 72 out, John 10, 1? Ooh, two by two. Two by two. This is the uh, iron sharpens iron. This is the Hebrews uh, uh, 10, 24. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us spur one another on toward love and good connection. We need each other. This is the whole Corinthians about the body. Do we really need that foot? Because I don't like that one. Turns out we do. But that foot's a little different color than me. That foot came with a different language. That one likes to stomp. That's the body. That's that connection. We need each other. Contribution, results. This is, I already said some things. I want to just uh, hand to mine. Thank you. Oh, this, I love this because, you know, it came from the farm. Um, you go through the, the parable of the, uh, the, the parable, this, uh, the farmer scattering seed. You remember this? And, and Jesus, this is a great one for those of us that don't get it right away. Because in most of them, he just says the parable, right? But remember, people didn't understand, so he says this. This is, this is for us. Jesus says this on this one. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. The seeds that fell on the, uh, on the footpath represent those who hear the message only to have the devil come in and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. Then this other seed, it fell on the rocky soil and it represents those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But then um, they don't get, it doesn't go deep, no deep roots. They believe for a while and then they fall away. They face temptation. But here's Americans, are you ready? This is what you're in right now. The seed that fell among the thorns represents who, the, those who hear the word, the message. We hear it more than anywhere else in the world anytime we want. But all too quickly, it's crowded out by their worries. We worry. And riches, we're rich. And pleasures. I don't want to think about the word of God. I could play Candy Crush. Let's waste some more time about something that doesn't have any eternal value, right? We can't wait to. I'm not saying never have fun, never have pleasure, that God didn't put creative, amazing things in our world, but man, do we love to have pleasure. It's a lot easier to watch Netflix than read the Word. And so they never grow into maturity. Boy, are we immature. And the seed that fell on the good soil represents the honest and good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. A hundred, in one translation, a hundred more times than was sown, right? He's, this, is the, this is the contribution pillar. This is the get results. Let's, let's produce a crop. So this is just, I'm speaking to myself here. But not be um, hindered by life's worries, I worry, and riches and pleasures. And it's real easy to not mature because of those three things. All right, that's the pillars. That's a very fast overview. I'm gonna honor my time a little bit. We have some left according to what was given to me, but uh, I might go deeper maybe on, just to give a little shot on two or three of them, but let's do this quick. Talk to the person next to you. What pillar you thought, oh, if we could work on that one in our church or that one in, our sp in the space that you have a domain of leadership, I'd like to focus on that one. What would it be? Over the next 90 days, what one would you focus on to gain trust as a church or as a leader? Talk to the person next to you. Roll your shoulders a little bit. Drink a little bit of water. Get ready for a little home, uh, home stretch here and uh, talk about it. You've got 70 seconds. Go.
like three of them. Okay, team. So, couple couple things. First of all, um, what what let's let's hear a couple of pillars that are coming to mind here. What something from this side? What what's a pillar you think? Ooh, that's the one I want to work on the most. Yes, sir. Consistency. Good. We'll talk about that one for a little bit. Um, when I, by the way, if you go through these with your, at your, with your board or at your meeting or something, I take and go through them, and this is what I would do. I'd say, hey, what are we doing well right now? You're imperfect. I'm imperfect. We're no good at a lot of them. But you're doing something well. Celebrate that. You do need to celebrate the things you're doing well. It's worth it. You'll do more of that. And then I would say, hey, what one could we just focus on in this time? And when you say that one, you said uh, consistency, I would say consistency where or consistency with whom? Because you, you could have the strongest and weakest pillar be the same. Clarity, like a leader might not be trusted because they're not clear about the vision. A manager might not be trusted because they're not clear about the expectations. A salesperson might not be trusted even though they're super clear about how cool they are and how long they've been in business. But they're not clear about the benefit of that product to me, so if they got clear on that, they'd sell more. The teacher, I got high character, the compassion. Why don't people like the teacher? They found out later that teacher was unclear about the assignments, so the kids go home frustrated. And it wasn't character, it wasn't compassion, it was a lack of clarity. So if you can say when you get it, think of just the spot. With whom or where? I need more consistency there, or I need more, and pick one spot. Got it? One spot. Remember, if we have more than three push forward priorities, we don't have any. If you have more than three push forward goals at your church, big goals that everybody you're pushing toward, you don't have any. Priority wasn't a plural word in the English language until uh, less than 80 years ago. You think you got to do everything because, oh, you're God's whatever. You're doing nothing if you have more than three. The data shows if you have one goal, one to three goals, you'll accomplish one to three. If you have four to seven, you'll accomplish one or two. And if you have more than seven, even though you think you're really cool, you won't accomplish any. Quit thinking you're more important and do something. You're overwhelming everybody. When I lost, I'm not going to tell the story tonight long, but when I lost the 52 pounds in, uh, what, five and a half months, and unlike Biggest Loser, where most people gain it right back, I've left it, kept it off for 10 years or so, um, I, I, knew I, could, I knew I needed to do something, but I, I'm writing a book, I'm not doing it now. I gotta finish my grad work, I'm not doing it now. I know I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna focus on it, but I gotta wait till it can be one of three or less. It's way too hard, it was, for me it was so magnificently hard to lose weight. So you have to narrow it to do something. Um, but uh, anyway, okay, so let's hear another one from this side. Consistency, we're gonna talk about that. What's another one from this side? Connection with whom? Team members, great place to start. What do many of us think? Well, we've got to connect with our, our people. If you connect with your own team, you'll do the most important thing. When did I like to fly Delta again? Because they made a great frequent flyer program for me, the guy that flies 200 flights a year? No. Ten years ago. They changed not my frequent flyer plan. They changed how they started to treat their own people. And what happened to me? I loved them because of they, the, the people that they started loving started treating me differently. If you got a problem with connection or compassion, start with your team. You'll have the biggest influence by doing that. It's just like this. It's just like our marriage, right? We think we got all oh, that kid problem, that kid problem. It's never that kid problem. It's, uh-oh, we better focus on us. Then the kid problem goes away. All right. Let's go through some more. Think about that, though. Think about which one. Just pick one and think about with whom. By the way, I'm going quickly. We're going to, you know, keep going here a little bit, he said. So um, uh, I should just pause. Anybody have any questions? Like, I've been in the toughest boardrooms ever, and someone's like, I, I, you know, you can push back. You need more research. Or somebody's still saying, oh, that trust stuff, that's mamby-pamby, soft skill stuff. Like someone need more research or not bought in or have a key question that they want answered. Like, oh, we had this trust guy, and he didn't even talk about that. Any, we okay? I'll just take us another direction. 
statistic. We trust you. You're so sweet. <laughs> there are good reasons not to trust, by the way. Even Jesus found them, but there are good reasons not to. Like, I don't trust my flight to be on time. I've had experience. I don't trust that boy with my daughter. I was a boy. I don't trust, you know, people that say things they don't mean, like, just trust me, or let me be honest with you. What do you mean for the last half hour, dude? Uh, you know, it's like, no, literally this time. I don't, I don't trust that, right? Honestly, literally. What's the question? Oh, Lordy. Statistically, what have you seen as the biggest violation of trust? I don't know if I could grab the statistic of the biggest violation. What I can say is, I, I don't think I would ask that question in research like that, but I would say the biggest violation that I feel is a character trust, right? Someone, to, I, really, I trusted them. In fifth grade, I trusted Jason T.D. not to tell everybody the girl I liked. He promised he wouldn't tell anybody. It broke my trust in him. Character trust. I will also back that up with what I think the biggest trust problem is for most people or uh, a problem that it seems like everybody has, and that is clarity. Leaders think they're clear, and they are not. I think I'm clear, and I'm not. And so those are two different answers to a question that didn't perfectly do the job, and we can talk at Dessert's coming. S, I'll be there. Okay? I did not have any pie before. I wonder what dessert is. They may know. What is it? Ice cream? <laughs> all right. One more question, then we're going. Thank you. Did you hear all that? It's a buffet, starting with cheesecake and brownies and some other things she said. What if they don't see any issues with how they're handling things? Uh, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Next question. <laughs> okay. So here's the deal. You, you know, in companies, here's what we do. We assess. So we have six different measurement tools that we measure trust in an organization. And when they see it through, through that, they, and we do this in, in ministries too, not, at, I, not any of the churches that I know of here, but like Salvation Army, other ministries. Um, when they see it that way, they tend to get it. There's a few other things you can do. Um, when you create, if you need to get buy-in going upward, okay, there's a few things. Let me give you a couple just tips out of the blue, okay? So because you, they're up here, okay? So you don't have, you can't say do this, right? Okay, Lord, I hope you're spending the right time on the right thing here. Um, I know you just ate and you're going to like pretty soon, okay. Um, but uh, I'll give you a couple things. Two things really quick. If you need to get buy-in up to someone who's authority over you, two ways of thinking about it. One is bring five whys and two hows. Hey, Mr. Pastor. Hey, board member. If, here's, here's what I learned about. Here's trust. Th this issue, this thing, this thing. Five whys to do that thing, that initiative. A lot of people stop there. They bring some whys, but they don't give two hows. You're in the front lines. They're so busy, they got everybody nagging at them for things they have to do. Do this, do that. I don't like the music. I don't like this. I don't like... Right? So give them five whys that this could help everybody and maybe even what God's saying to you. And then give them two hows. I think if we just did this and this, that might help. And then, the, oh, you got solutions too? I might do it now. By the way, if you have a narcissist, make sure one of those five whys makes them look really good then you have a chance of it happening. I'm not kidding. Okay? Uh, so I got to keep moving, but one more thing for you. Okay, you got to get buy-in from the top. Ready? Start with empathy. Most people don't know the weight of leadership. It's heavy. It's hard. And it is, it is, there's a lot of weight on leadership. So if you can just empathize and say, I know you've got all these things. I know everybody's saying all this. I know everybody wants their kind of music. I know they want this, that, whatever it is. If you can just start, and not just saying it, but feeling it, feeling the weight. Like, that's a gift for me is I uh, am trusted by some very senior leaders. But I feel their weight. I feel it. Uh, then number two is you got this initiative you want credibility. It might not be you, but you can say, um, hey, I saw in this research, if we focus on trust or let's, you know, whatever it is you're talking about, if, 
use somebody else, but use credibility or God's word or something credible to them that is hopefully genuinely credible. Number three, show transformation. If you can show, hey, if we do this, I've seen we could look like this. This is why the, the weight loss brochure shows fatso and then cut dude. Whoa, that can happen to me? Uh, what's your plan? Right? You, this, I've heard, if, this ha if we do this, then we could look like this. If we do this, we could look more loving with people that would never come here. Right? Transformation. Finally, uh, not finally, humility, giving humility up. Showing that, hey, you're just, you're humbly presenting this. Uh, another thing, if you give conviction about it, just conviction, it's just like a testimony because it's true. If you can give conviction to that person, you can t tip them sometime. And there's one more thing. You're going to have to email me about it. I forgot. I um, can't remember. It'll come to me. Maybe I'm talking. I'm, I shared it yesterday on that call with our coaches. Do you remember it? I don't know. I said, I said a lot on that call. I know. Okay. <laughs> Okay, let's, uh, let's touch base on a couple of these. I, I don't think I'm going to do this one right now. I think, whoops. Okay, let's just talk about two. Commitment. Commitment. Clarity, schmerity, right? Uh, if we want to come back to it and you think we really have time or you want to, I will stay up all night at the desserts if you have questions uh, and happy, you no know, consulting fees or anything or, you know, just I'll, I'll stay there. I know some people will need to do, get to their kids because you're supposed to be there right when the session's done. I heard. Okay? Commitment. Let's talk about this. People trust those that are committed. This, this really is, I know it's easy as pastors to wear out. In fact, some of you are so cynical by now, it's hurting everybody around you. Maybe not in this room, but I, in, in pastor groups that I've spoken to. Staying committed, I mean, this is, the, I, this is why I think it was talked about so much, Paul, the, the whole finish the race thing, because it's doggone hard. There's a lot of them that don't finish. Not many Pastor Jim's around. They don't stick. They don't stay married. They don't stay with it. They don't keep praying. They don't keep on when it's hard, when it feels like God's silent, when you got 400 years of Hezekiah. I mean, it doesn't, people don't last for that. A couple commitment slides to get us going. That one's for me. <laughs> Doggone, Baskin Robbins is amazing. These guys are committed. <clears throat> What's the number one asked for tattoo in America that is commercial? Not a mom across her heart, but a company tattoo. Number one tattoo. If you get it tattooed on your body, you got to be committed, right? What is it? Are Harley riders committed? They'll go to, they'll go to Milwaukee. They'll wear the goods. They'll get on it. They'll, they'll, they'll 300,000 of them will gather together in the middle of the highest uh, COVID numbers ever and kiss and hug in Sturgis. I mean, they are committed. Was it always this way? No, in 1981, when the new ownership took over this tanking little motorcycle company that should have been wiped off the map of American history, they said, we're going to be committed to two things in a whole new way. Number one, we're going to be committed to quality. And number two, we're going to be committed to our favorite first-time buyer, who they defined at the time as the yuppie that wants to look like a renegade on the weekend. And they stayed committed to those doctors and nurses and rich pastors and dentists, and lawyers, those renegade, those, those, those folks that want to look like a renegade on the weekend, and that could afford it. And if you would have put a dollar in Harley stock in the, in the 25 years back from when I did my original research, back to that commitment day, your dollar would have been in one of the top 25 American stocks, and your dollar would have appreciated by, uh, like, Berkshire Hathaway, Microsoft, and a few others, like uh, 18 thousand percent. Commitment breeds commitment. You don't get it without giving it. How do you rebuild trust? We've got a process for rebuilding trust. 
10-step process. If you had an oil spill, you're a company that had an oil spill or you're whatever. But whether you're a big company or an individual, it comes down to one thing, and it is not the apology. You never rebuild trust on the apology. I'm sorry I'm late. No, you're not. You're late every time. This doesn't mean you shouldn't apologize. Show humility. This doesn't mean that apology won't open connection. You, you ought to apologize, but you don't rebuild trust on the apology. That's what the data would say, right? You don't rebuild trust there. The only way to rebuild trust, anybody ever made a mistake or had to uh, rebuild trust? Anybody? Okay, a few liars. All right. So there's only one way to rebuild trust, and that is whether you're a big company at the end of the 10-step process or an individual, there's only one way you have to make and keep a new commitment. And it starts with yourself. I got to go to the farm. So Lisa and our, um, Jan and I had a great dad and um, he's still around, 93 years old, still running the farm up there, mom and dad are. But I'll never forget this day. I was 10 or 11 years old, and I was, um, I, all the older kids, like Jan, she's way older than me, she doesn't look at, but she's a dec decade older than me. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. She, so they were, they were all off the farm, college or whatever they were doing. And is it hot down there? Just take your stuff off if you need to. It's hot up here. It's not too much stuff. It's church, but... Um, <laughs> This is a different show. Okay, so, so uh, I got to, whoo. All right, so basically, uh, I'll never forget this day. I was 10 or 11 years old. Mom and dad were on the farm, and me, and all the other kids were out the farm. Sun comes up uh, early in northern Minnesota, 5 in the morning, 4 something in the morning, whatever. So 5 in the morning, we had breakfast. 5.30 in the morning, we're out the door. I jump in the blue Chevy pickup truck with my dad, and, uh, and mom stayed in the house, and we uh, drove down the dirt, the dirt driveway, and we went from field to field in the irrigator to irrigator. We're checking the crops, and we're in the far reaches of the farm. It's a public dirt road. And there's some junk in the middle of the dirt road. And I knew something about my daddy. He didn't have to say a thing. He hates litter. I knew exactly what I was supposed to do when he swerved that pickup truck over in such a way that my door was immediately above that litter. 10 or 11 years old, I open the door, I reach down, and I pick up that Playboy magazine. Now, I'm not here to tell you necessarily what's right and wrong. You know. But I knew what my daddy thought about this kind of thing. I'd seen him mentor our rough, tough, hired guys, my older brothers. I knew he didn't think it was the right way to look at women and the right way to treat women. I knew exactly what he thought. But today I would see it. I dropped to the floor of the pickup truck. He kicked it under the seat. We kept going from field to field and the irrigator to irrigator that morning. Pretty soon it's mid-morning on the farm. Some of you all know what that is, about 730. Drove up the quarter mile driveway. I got out the house to help my mom play. I don't know what I did. But uh, he drove the pickup truck out to the shop, uh, the Morton building, the, the combine area. And there's some stuff out there. Now, you can't see. There's no windows on that back side of the house. No way to see what dad was up to. No way to see what he was doing. And the phone rang. Can you remember in the house, the phone rang. Only mom and I are in the house. There's no windows looking out there. But the phone rang. And there's, there, there, so who do you remember when there's one phone on a farm with a cord attached? Who y'all knows what party lines are? You've let, you, speaking of trust issues, right? Hmm, what are they doing over there? Hmm? Mom took the message. Nothing was so urgent then. She, usually she would just put it on dad's lunch spot. But on this day, she said, David, go give this to your dad. I took the message, and I ran out in the attached garage. No way he knew I would come, it was coming. Lost a lot of his hearing in the Korean War. It was 100 yards away. There's no windows on that side of the house except... In the uh, garage, there's one little entry door and one kind of little entry door window. I don't even know why I busted right. I, I, I usually just busted right through it and ran out, right? But I paused inside. And without making a sound, I peered through that window. I still don't know why. But what I saw would change my life forever. Because I knew what my dad said about this kind of thing, and today I would see it. From 100 yards away. I watched my daddy pull himself out from under the tractor. I watched him walk around the other side of it, walk over behind the combine, walk between two trees, watch the other side of the uh, blue Chevy pickup truck. And without thinking a soul was watching, I watched him open that pickup truck. 
and where you can't even see another farm from ours. I watched him reach under the seat. I watched him pick up that Playboy magazine. And then I watched him. Without taking a glance, I watched him keep his arm stretched and walk 30 paces over to the shop furnace where I watched him throw it into the fire. You think I trust my daddy? Because he does what he says he'll do even when no one's looking for that's where he grabbed the habits for when someone just might be. I wondered why people love working for our dad. He's, he's good at agriculture, he's a good farmer. Why did, why did they love working for him? That was that. You can tell when someone does what's right over what's easy. We love to be around people. We love to follow pastors that actually do what's right or what's easy. I've got three questions for you. They seem elementary, but you need to ask them. So do I. Three questions. Number one, would you follow you? One of the saddest things when I started speaking more, and I got just last year got the opportunity to be the opening keynote of the biggest leadership conference in our country. I think it's 100,000 people watching or something like that, LeaderCast. I, one of the saddest things for me is I, I excited got to be around some of my mentors. And I found some of them are a whole lot different in the green room than they are on stage. And then I found that's true of some pastors. Would you follow you? Number two, do you have decision-making values? This is in the last book, The Trusted Leader. If you can't afford it, or you just want me to email you the process, you need to do it, I think. It can help. It's not your values like family, faith, Jesus. Jesus can be the answer to everything else, but that's not what I'm talking about. Do you have decision-making values? Values you make decisions by. People trust you more, and your decision-making gets quicker if you have this process. Can't do it right now, but if you'd like it, I'll email it to you. Do you incentivize against the character you want to see? You'd think I wouldn't say, have to ask this in church, and you know, we need to ask it more than ever. You're incentivizing a safe place for, let's say, people of color or women to talk by what you laugh at and what you allow and what you listen to. You're incentivizing. I watched a pro sports team that won, should have won it all. I watched them incentivize sarcasm too much, and it killed these $100 million athletes that could not handle that much sarcasm. You know the root of that word. The Latin root is dog ripping flesh. And there's faux trust builders, right? Sarcasm is funny. I love humor. And sarcasm can be fun until it's not. It's kind of like gossip, right? That's a faux trust builder. I gossip to you. We kind of trust each other until I walk away and think, uh-oh, we might do that when I'm not there. This question needs to be in your annual meeting, not, not the public one, the, the uh, strategic planning you do every time with the other questions. You need to ask, as, a, as your, little leader, your leadership team, are, is, hey, are the, is there any way we're incentivizing? And the first person you need to listen to is the least, the most voiceless. Ask, in many cases, the woman, the person of color, the youngest. They let them answer first. Okay, whip this together. This will be fast, consistency. Last pillar, whip through it for you. Sameness, here we go, consistency. It's the little things done consistently that make the biggest difference, not the big things. Little things done consistently. If I'm overweight, I've had too many scoops of ice cream over years, not because I ate too much this morning for breakfast. If I'm a good husband, I've loved my wife over years, not because I gave her a diamond ring one time or a dozen roses one time. If I'm a good leader, I'm sharing the vision consistently. If you're not sharing the vision of your church at least every 14 days, nobody knows it. So they're not making decisions by it. So you just shared, you think you got clarity because you shared the vision at the annual meeting and nobody knows it and you lost all your clarity because you're not sharing it consistently at least every 14 days. We got a big problem. Every interaction we have with every single person, we increase or decrease trust. This is a big challenge. The way you showed up in the boardroom last week, they trust you a little bit more, a little bit less. This is a very good friend of mine, Kevin Ridgway. You can see we're different in a couple ways. This, was, this picture was taken January 12, 2017, the day before he was hit head on by a Land Rover that squashed him in his vehicle. The surgeon said he would have died immediately except for the muscle mass he had on his chest. He lived. He went into a coma. 
Doctors said he would not wake. If he did, it would be with brain damage. Five and a half weeks later, my friend Kevin woke up without brain damage. Miracle. 66 days later, Kevin was able to stand up for the first time and put his now clean gym clothes back on. Only stood by his bed for a few seconds, and I got a picture. In 66 days, Kevin lost 66 pounds. No fault of his own, but what's the message for you, your church, your family, and me? Atrophy is guaranteed without intentional action. A body is atrophying every single day. The church message, your message, your connection with your people, your, you have to put trust building in consistently. Because of time, everybody's forgetting. Some of you will forget what I said by the end of this. We're such a noisy world. T t it it's, you have to keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. On the farm, we say this, healthy things grow and sick things die. And the same with churches, right? Healthy cows grow, sick ones die. Healthy marriages grow, sick ones become divorced. Healthy churches grow, sick ones become divided. Healthy things tend to grow. It might not even be number of people, but it's growing in some way. People are growing. They're being discipled. All right, there's the eight-pillar framework. A quick overview of them. You might take those. You might bring them to your meeting. You might bring the scripture with them and say, hey, what one of these could we do a little bit over the next 90 days? So... I'm going to wrap with one quick story, but before I do, roll your shoulders. i got to get on a plane early. I'll stay as late as you want to be. But first, with the person next to you, what pillar are we going to work on over the next 90 days? What pillar are we going to work on over the next 90 days? Write it down with the person you're sitting next to. If you want to, uh, Amy, I think we're going to give a plan of, uh, via email and video of how you can implement that. But for now, pick one. Now you only have 30 seconds. Go. Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, I hope you got one. Hey, if you got kids, get out of here. Go get your, go get your people. I'm going to tell one last story for the rest of them. We, there's other problems with having kids. We all know that, so sorry. You got to go. Um, but I, I will say this. Let, even those, those with kids, let me, let me show you mine really quick. Um, if you want the free stuff, you can come to back to the table and put your email there, or you can snap that. There's my four kids. We just showed the picture when they were still cute. Now, now they're teenagers. Um, <laughs> just, ha, ha, ha. Okay, um, that's uh, the free stuff we promised that you can keep taking trust into your church or your community. If you have ch kids, go grab them and let me bring us to a close with this. So what I loved to do when I grew up, is, especially when I was 10 years, I was, oh, I was 12 years old when I loved riding horse. I had this horse named Kojo. And I would jump on, it was a fast horse, and if you've never gone from a gallop to a run, a lot of people, you know, you go into the horse place, and you have a little, follow the tail next to you. If you've never gone on a, gotten on a running horse, you haven't lived. I mean, it's amazing. You're a little out of control. It'll take the breath out of you. It's like, ah, right? Okay, so this, um, on this day, uh, I, I was going as fast as I could, 12 years old, across this alfalfa field. Even a really good horse can get spooked by a snake or in late June in Minnesota when the alfalfa is this high and the irrigation pipe is this high. You cannot believe how fast that horse can stop. Bam! And you fly, you, that neck, it looks soft, it'll break your nose. But on this day, I went flying over the left-hand side. Now, what I'm going to tell you is exactly how my dad had a neighbor come home, drug home dead this way in North Dakota where he grew up. For that reason, he taught us to always wear cowboy boots. Why do you wear cowboy boots? So your foot doesn't go through the stirrup. But I didn't listen, and I was kind of a jock, or tried to be. 
and so I had nice slippery basketball shoes on. And I flew off that left side, except for my left basketball slidey foot went right through that stirrup. That horse stops, you go flying, and then it stops and rears up and yanks you backwards. And even a good horse hates the feel of you yanking the saddle the wrong way. So what to do? A good horse will buck and kick and crow hop and then drag you over rocks or irrigation pipe or whatever because it can't stand the feel of that. And I was being drug and drug and drug and drug. And it, I would say, it, um, it, you think you're going to die, right? And I don't know, but just in a moment, I just slipped out back on the alfalfa. And have you ever had the wind knocked out of you? Anybody else had an older brother? We, so if you haven't, you need this experience too. It's unlike anything else. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Can't, I just lay there. Oh, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And then I, I was like, I said, I, I, I can, I was okay. And I sat up. And I looked, maybe it was 100 yards away at the irrigator. My dad was working on an irrigator. And Kojo had run right over to him, and he was just holding the horse. And I started to get up and think, I, I'm okay. I'm okay. And as I stood up, my knees did something I've never had happen before or since. They started shaking in a way that I couldn't control them. I don't know if you've ever been that scared. And then, in our no-crying Norwegian family, I started bawling. I couldn't stop it. <laughs> and I walked over toward Dad. And as I got closer, his loving blue eyes looked at me. He did not say a word. He just held the horse. And I knew what? You got to get back on the horse. Who's that for? Not just me. It's for the horse. I, I uh, when I was, I don't know, 15 or something, I had trained a horse for buggy. One of the things that can happen with a buggy is it starts kicking the buggy, and you can have a runaway. If you ever have a runaway, you almost never hook it back up because a big animal like that thinks they can get away with that, and it can be terribly dangerous. I think we were in one that had a runaway, weren't we? Um, but uh, you, it can be very dangerous. You might never hook it up again. If a horse like that, 1,100-pound, 900-pound animal, can gets away with, with uh, dragging you, running, doing any of these things, you've got to get right back on for them and for you. Some of you, you came through COVID. It was terrible. You didn't know what to do. You came, you got, you're worn out. You're discouraged. And you need help. Some of you need mental health help. Get it. Some of you need a, uh, a, um, a Christian counselor, get one. But if you're going to pastor and you're going to lead, you need to get the help you need right now. And if you're going to lead, you've got to get back on the horse. We need you to get back on the horse. We need you to show some leadership again. We need you to build trust. And it's active and it's work. This is the last word of the time. Um, this is David. You know, David doesn't get to even build the temple. You remember this, right? Too much blood on his hands. So David tells Solomon, David, be strong and courageous and do the work. I'm telling you, trust takes work. You could have had some motivational speaker come in, you can do this in 21 days, and that's really easy. Baloney. Baloney. Trust takes work. Don't be afraid or discouraged. Some of you are discouraged in your work. Be strong and courageous and do the work. Don't be afraid or discouraged for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He won't fail you. He won't forsake you. He'll see to it that all the work related to the temple of, of the Lord is finished correctly and so on. I think it's the word for us tonight. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you for these leaders, for these pastors. Thank you for what you're doing in them and through them. I pray you'd have your hand upon them. I pray you'd help them to trust you. And I pray 
that you would help them to be more and more and more trustworthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. There is dessert to follow. Uh, let's stand together. Uh, there are books to purchase in the other room. Bless David and yourselves. Um, there are kids to retrieve. But there's also perhaps some people who just need to spend a little time with Jesus. And some of you need to come and say, I, I, I just need to trust Jesus again. I need to trust God. I need, I need to trust God again. And if you'd like prayer, just we're going to sing a little while. Just come up and just, just say, I just need to trust God again. And some of you might need to say, I need, I need to be trustworthy. And you think you may have blown it. Or, but I need to be trustworthy. And if you want to just come up and just say, I just need to be trustworthy. Let's pray together. Can we do that? Can we do that? On us, if you would lead us, and feel free to go to dessert. Feel free to come up front. We're going to stick around for as long as you need. God bless you. Thank you. 
breath.